Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Q&A session for XC2. Um, my name is Sophia Wood. As a reminder, I work for Operation Wallacea, directing our uh, operations in Ecuador. And I also run uh, the initiative called Friends of Wallacea, working with OPWAL's partners around the world to develop full year-round conservation programs through uh, wildlife tourism. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Jose Nunes Mino, who is the Director of Communications and Fundraising at the Bat Conservation Trust. Um, we'll be asking Dr. Jose about his work um, with bats in the UK, and obviously a bit about his career as well. Um, if you were able to tune into his lecture, you'll hear a little bit about his career switch from IT into conservation. Um, and we'll, we'll ask him a bit about that today. Um, if you have any questions while we're talking, um, you can put them in the chat either on Facebook or YouTube, or you can email them to us at xc2 at opwall.com. And if you're watching this on the Opwall website, you can click on the YouTube button and it will open the stream in a new tab that will give you access to the chat. Um, finally, if you want to get notifications for when new episodes are out, you can sign up for the newsletter on the XC2 page on the Opwall website at opwall.com. And please subscribe to our channel to be updated with new videos every time we release them. Well, thank you so much for joining us this, this morning, afternoon in the UK. <laughs> My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. It was, great. it was great to hear your story on the lecture series. I think it's a bit of a story of inspiration for people who want to get into conservation and maybe didn't know that right away, especially kind of while going through university and everything like that. So you, you talked a lot about obviously learning about your interest in conservation as, as a kid and then as well um, while you were doing your career in IT. So what kind of conservation work and volunteering were you doing alongside your IT career? And how can you find these things to do if you're pursuing a full-time career at the same time? Yeah, it's it's tough, isn't it? Um, it you um, if, if you're trying to fit it around a full time job, then it is it is quite a, quite a lot of um, hard work, and you do have to um, be quite dedicated to it. Otherwise, you know, um, it becomes a chore. And when I was doing that volunteering a long time ago, I hasten to add, well, don't, I still do a bit of volunteering now, but um, it, you know, it was a, it was for me, it was like I got huge amounts of pleasure from it, and I did quite a range of things. So I, I did things like um, for the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers, I believe they're still going, but I think they're called the, just the Trust for Conservation Volunteers. Um, I did a lot of on the ground sort of clearing areas of um, invasive um, trees and, and that, that type of sort of uh, physical outdoor work, which was really, really good fun. But I also did things like I volunteered for the Woodland Trust and gave talks. Um, uh, it was all sorts of places that I ended up giving talks. Um, and I really enjoyed that side of it as well, which was the engagement um, okay. bit of it. Um, I also did a bit of fundraising. So, you know, doing events and stuff for various charities. Um, I volunteered with Plant Life for a while as well, working in their office. So I really tried lots of different things just to get a flavor for the full range of um, opportunities across the charitable sector. I think. Um, if you want to do that type of thing, if you want to be involved in at the volunteer level, then just just contact charities, you know, and if you can find a local charity, um, very often they're even more desperate to and more accommodating to your needs. Um, or that was my experience. The larger organizations tended to be a lot more structured, whereas if you find a local group that's working in your area um, and they have particular needs that you you can work you know that you can provide for them then they're, they're, they're more than likely to, to welcome you in and it's it's just a positive experience you get to meet other like-minded people um and you get to begin to get a feel for when we talk about conservation it's a whole lot of things it's not one thing and that's yeah. what you want from it well that's really good advice I mean, i think obviously a lot of these small local organizations always need people who can volunteer their time so um yeah even just reaching out and offering to help usually is a really good start. Um, kind of on that topic, what was your first volunteering experience in conservation? 
Oh, uh, now that's that's taking me back a bit. Um, I think <laughs> it was British Trust for Conservation Volunteers because I just saw them. I, I you know, I, I wanted to do something on the weekends. Yeah, I, I did enjoy going for runs and doing things like that, but I wanted something yeah. physical that was outdoors, and they mm. they fitted that that profile. Um, at the international level, I did something quite similar to Operation Wallace. I won't mention who, but it was a, somebody very similar to Operation Wallace here. And that was my first sort of um, uh, volunteering experience abroad. And I, I ended up going to Madagascar for the first time I did that. Right. Um, and that was really, really, uh, that was a, a life-changing moment for me. I can imagine. I, I think, obviously, for a lot of us who... And, me myself, my my conservation work was really kind of launched by my first work with Opwal, um, and being in the field often I think has this very strong ability to kind of change your heart and mind towards something. Just being there and you know working with the animals directly or with the plants is yeah. is very very powerful. Um, so what obviously you made a very kind of large career transition, even though you were always really passionate about conservation. Um, what was the most difficult part of transitioning from a career in, in IT into conservation? Oh, that, that's a really easy question. <laughs> the, the hardest bit was money. You know, you never <laughs> go to conservation for money. And I took yeah. a huge hit financially. Um, but my happiness level more than made up for that. Um, so, you know, uh, the salary I was earning before was it's more than what I earn nowadays um sure. you know it, it, you, you just don't you don't so that in terms of the hardest thing it was that um I think once my career developed I think the other thing that you realize is that you have to make some sacrifices so for example a lot of my work um before took me abroad for big long chunks of time um and you know as much as I loved being in, in tropical forests in different parts of the world and I did love it you do miss, um, you know, being with around your friends, uh, around your family, and that's an aspect that you you have to make a sort of um, a deal with yourself about. You know, it, it's, it's it's worth it, and you you keep on having to ask yourself that question, um, particularly because conservation is, although you know, working with animals is fantastic, and being in unique tropical places is fantastic. It does come with its own challenges you know it's it's if anyone goes in thinking that it's easy i would suggest that you review that situation because i've not ever been in a in a situation where I, where i've worked um in conservation and where it's been easy it's been enjoyable but it's never been easy i, I think that's very true and it's definitely something we've heard echoed from a lot of our other participants saying you know you often get this very romanticized attractive picture of what wildlife conservation looks like in terms of just looking at monkeys or or elephants or something and that really a lot of the time you're much deeper into something you're counting leaves or you're digging dung beetles out of something yeah. um, and and it and and it's tr truly i completely agree it's a really enjoyable experience but it's not what it looks like on on a camera all the time yeah. for sure yeah. um so what would you recommend for people who might be considering this kind of dramatic career switch in terms of how to get started or think it through? Okay, so uh, I can read, I think everyone has their own individual path to take. So I'm not, I can, I can only share my path and say, yeah. this is what worked for me. And I, I think I did have a slightly romanticized view of what a career in conservation was going to be like. <laughs> But I thought, okay, I really need to test myself. Is this re is this reality, or am I living a, a sort of in some sort of mental film set about you know um, Indiana Jones or something like that? You know that that's the sort of what I was thinking. I was thinking, is this real? So when I went to Madagascar, it was a three week expedition, and it was one of the toughest. It's not the toughest thing because it's been superseded by other experiences, but it really really tough. I mean, it was. Yeah. You know, um, unless you haven't washed for two weeks, you really can't imagine what that's like. Um, unless you've only eaten rice for breakfast, lunch and dinner for three weeks with various sources, but basically rice all the time. You don't know what it's like. Um, 
unless you've woken up one morning and realized that you're covered in ticks, you do not know what that's like. <laughs> now, all of those experiences, I, I've made it sound terrible, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it, even though it was tough. It's going back to that, you know. Um, so I'd say to anyone considering it, test yourself. Make sure before you actually hand your keys in or your job in or, you know, use up all your savings, go out and do something, even for a month or, let you know, two, whatever you can afford, just go out and test whether this is really what you want to do. And the other bit of advice that I'd say is, it's not all about the animals. If you're going to conservation, particularly into conservation, so there is a huge difference between doing research and conservation. And if you're doing conservation, make sure you like people because it is 90% about people. If you want to save wildlife, if you want to make, you know, uh, make the world more sustainable, if you want to improve the world's environment, then you need to be able to relate to people even people you might not necessarily like that's terrible but but you know people that you, that's hard you, work. <laughs> you have to be able to sit down with people and, and talk to them in an open way and understand their point of view even when it's completely opposed to your point of view and find that common ground so yeah that's a i think that's a really good point and it leads us into um one of the questions that we got in that is um, obviously you, you went from IT into research originally and went and got a PhD and then we're doing some field research before moving into this conservation and communication side more, more fully. So what made you decide to make the switch from doing kind of the pure field research side into working in holistic conservation, um, and particularly into a role that's now mostly communications and fundraising based? So, again, this has probably got several parts to it. Um, sure. I think one of the, <laughs> when I was doing research, I loved it. You know, I really, truly loved it. But it morphed into more than just research naturally. So I could have just gone into these remote villages and done, you know, uh, research around the species that I was looking at. But actually, I ended up speaking to people and they were interested in why I was doing this research. And that grew on to, to being more about the conservation side of things and saying, well, we're doing this research because we think it's important to find out about this species because X, Y, Z, i.e. it's rare, we want to save it, or, or we're just interested in it from a purely curious point of view. So yeah. there was that aspect of it that sort of, like I say, I, I really began to realise how important the research is absolutely critical, but equally so is that aspect of um, engaging in, in with people and, and sharing the conservation message. Um, why it then went on to communications and fundraising is because one of my personal frustrations is that um, a lot of projects are based on a three to five year cycle. And three to five years doesn't work for conservation. Um, yeah. If you go to people like Carl Jones, who's with the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, he's done some great research on this. And when you're talking about recovery of species, you're talking about 10, 20, 30 years. So the, right. the, the short term models just doesn't doesn't work. Um, and I thought I, I want I want to have a role where I can shape that long term planning for conservation. And that's how I ended up in the role that I am in at the moment. So fundraising, because we need to secure the funds to have these long-term projects and communication, because conservationists can't just work in isolation. We can't create these bubbles where we're just speaking to ourselves. We need to reach out to policymakers. We need to reach out to communities on the ground, and we need to be able to communicate effectively with all those groups. Well, I think that's a great point. Obviously, that's something we believe really strongly at Opwall in terms of the you know, the need for long-term monitoring and how much we've been able to find out by monitoring an area for 20 years versus three. Yeah. Um, as you said, obviously, if you look at the data, you can, you know, see a 20-year data screen. And if you circle just three years of data on there, you would get totally different conclusions yeah. from yeah. if you'd looked at the whole 20 years. So um, I think that's a, yeah. that's a really important point. Obviously, it's just the way research is structured in the world around academia is unfortunately all these shorter term grants. Um, so I wanted to transition a little bit more into specifically 
um, the work that you're doing with bats. Um, so how could somebody get trained to help monitor bats? Is there a qualification or a course that you can do? So if you're in the UK, and I'll stick to the UK for now on this sure. one, I, I would say that um, joining your local bat group is the best way forward on that. There are about 90 bat groups across the UK. Um, they vary quite a lot from really small groups to quite large groups with different levels of experience. But that's the way that you're going to learn, you know, the, the basics about from sort of learning how to use a bat detector through to finding out more about the 18 species of bats that we get in the UK. So um, in the UK, I'd say that's the best way forward. If you're going to, if, you, if you're talking internationally, it's really interesting because one of the, I'm not going to say advantages of COVID-19, but one of the effects of COVID-19 has been that a lot of training has moved online. So for example, for us, Bat Conservation Trust, we had a training event that was canceled back in May. And normally we would have expected about 30 people to show up. We bought it online and um, about 300 people showed up and from across the world. Um, and so I think there's an advantage, you know, there may be opportunities for people to um, learn more about bats and bat conservation digitally. So, so that's, that's an opportunity that, that people should be aware of. Um, yeah, I, I'd say those are the two things that I would, I would go down if you're going to, if you're going to, if you want to develop a career in bat conservation, if you want to become a consultant, which is a big area of um, work in the UK, then um, again, you, you'd probably go to one of the um, consultancy bodies and find out how to go about doing that. But there is a a qualification process that you go through but that's a, a different sort of aspect of, of bat conservation right um well that that's helpful and it's nice that i you know it's nice that things are coming online now and it becomes a lot more accessible for yeah. people hopefully they'll continue to be online in the future yeah. even when we can join together again that you can still broadcast them so that people around the world can continue get, to get trained um yeah. obviously you know bats are within it sounds like within conservation and within the research um you kind of characterize bats as unloved and misunderstood potentially not one of the animals that people are as excited to see or care about so why do you think that they have such a bad reputation and is there anything we can do about it um so i think that the bats fall into this funny category where um, there are a small percentage of people who absolutely love bats, you know, who, who have huge passion for bat and bats and bats conservation. Um, and then there are another small proportion of people who absolutely hate bats, um, who for, for a variety of reasons, which I'll probably come back to. And then there's the middle ground where people, most people are just unaware of bats. Sure. Um, I've had some really great experiences in um, uh, parks in cities like London. Um, where I'm based, and where we're doing a, a night survey or a bat walk, and we're walking through this city park, and suddenly you come across a group of kids that are just hanging out, doing nothing, just just hanging out in the park. And as soon as they see the weird guy with with um, bat detectors walking along, they're thinking, "What on earth are they doing?" And if you start speaking to them, they suddenly become really, they, they didn't know there were bats above them. You know, they they, they have no when. So I think that that's the majority of people they're just not aware of the, of bats being around. Mm -hmm. um, with the people that strongly dislike bats um, or have a phobia about them, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. Um, the way they're portrayed in the media, um, the association with rabies is one that you get quite strongly in, in places like um, the USA, not so much in the UK, although there's a bit of that. Um, and also, you know, the film, everyone says it, Dracula. We blame Dracula for, for the bad rap that bats get. But... To be honest, I think the, the root of it is that it's a, a species that we can't relate to very well. It's nocturnal, it's secretive. Um, you you don't know how to relate to this species, where I think with the species that we have an immediate attachment to, we can relate to them. Um, sure. birds, birds are the classic, right? Birds are visual, they're colorful, they're mostly diurnal, and we can we can relate to them almost immediately, even though we're more closely related to bats, they are weirder in, in, in some way. And that, that creates a barrier. 
but I've also been in a room where a group of people have seen a one of our really most charismatic species in the UK, the brown long-eared bat, um, which has ears that are almost as long as its body. Oh, wow. Um, and when they're asleep, those ears are wrapped up under their wings. And as they wake up, they unfurl and open up. And I've seen a whole room of people melt when that happens. So I think in terms of winning people over is I dare anyone not to find a brown long-eared bat cute. Um, okay. So it's about reaching out, um, educating people about bats, um, not just about their value to us as, as you know, um, I hate using the term pest controllers, but they do eat a lot of insects that damage crops and gardens. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a purely utilitarian thing about bat conservation, but there's also the fact that they are super cute. Um, <laughs> they only have one baby a year. They're, you know, they're, they're, they hibernate throughout winter. I'm, I'm so with that. I'd love to hibernate my winters away. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think it's just getting that message across. Okay, so everyone should then, while you're on YouTube, after you finish watching this, should look up a video of a long, what's it, a brown long-eared bat? Brown long-eared bat, yeah. A brown yeah. long-eared bat waking like up. I'm sure you can find that. It's, I'm, I haven't seen one of one wake Do you know what? I'm going to film it. I don't have film of that, yeah, but there must be film of that out there. This. We'll make it go viral. I, did, I, would, I would love to see it. Um, one thing that you mentioned to me while we were just talking before this was was something about monitoring the bats in East London and that you could follow them via Twitter. Sorry, it might be frozen. You fr froze for a second. I'm not sure if you're... Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, um, okay. Miniature technical difficulties, but um, well, I was just saying... Um, I, I wanted to bring up what you were talking to me about just before we went live about the stadium in east london where you can track the bats a little bit via twitter um yeah. which is another way i suppose people could get to know bats a little bit more from the Absolutely. country of home <laughs> yeah so it's queen elizabeth um olympic park and the twitter handle is i think it's at bats underscore london and okay. it's a completely automated process these bat detectors i think there's Eight, there are eight of them scattered around the park. They detect how many bat calls. They don't identify them to species, but they'll tell you the number of bat calls. And it's quite, it, it tweets every morning. Once it's done its analysis, it sends out this tweet. And you can see, as, as winter approaches, you can see the number of calls reducing. And then it goes to zero. And then in spring, you can see every day a few more calls. It's, it's a great, great, great tool. Yeah. That's, and you get a little map. Really cool. Yeah. And a good a good little mix of technology and conservation, Absolutely. obviously making it much more accessible. So, speaking of kind of making bat conservation accessible, what is the best thing that your average member of the public can do to contribute to bat conservation? Oh, that's okay. It's a bit of a minefield. This, and I'll start with the worst bit, which is never popular, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say it anyway. Um. We run a national bat helpline, okay? So this is for people who need advice with bats. Um, and it can be, most of the advice is about, you know, I, I've got bats in my roof, but I need a new roof. What do I do about it? And we, we provide advice because we, you can still get your new roof, but you just need to take the bats into account in that process. But a lot of the calls we get are about bats that have been grounded or injured. Um, about 60% of those bats, we now know, it's because of cats, I'm afraid, domestic cats. So if you've got a cat, I would beg you to keep your cat indoors. Not all I know not, not all cats can stay indoors all the time. I, I, I respect that. But if you can do it at least at um, sunset and sunrise, that it would be a huge benefit um, for bat conservation in the UK. Um, there are lots of other things you can do to help bats. Um, switch off your lights um, is, is another one. Um, a lot of people see bats hunting around lights and they think, oh, that's a good thing. It's not actually a good thing because, one, a lot of bats will just simply not go near, those bat species will not go near um, artificial lights. Yeah. Um, the other effect that it has is it draws insects from nearby areas, denying the bats that are hunting in those dark areas the insects that have been drawn to those artificial lights. You also get really curious effects where you get one species, uh, the male, 
I can't remember which way around it is, but I think it's the males will hunt around light, but the females won't. Hmm. Um, it's, so you get all these curious effects. Basically, the darker it is, the better for bats. Yeah. And then the third thing is, if you're doing anything in your garden that's insect friendly, insects equal bat food. So, you know, whether you've got a pond or a compost heap or whether you leave a bit of your um, lawn unmown and sort of wildflowers, um, if you've got a variety of flowers, that's also great because when bats emerge from hibernation, they're really hungry. So if you've got flowers in your garden that are attracting insects, that will attract the bats. Um, uh, so anything that's insect friendly is going to be bat friendly. Awesome. Perfect. Well, so we have just about five minutes to go. So for anybody who's watching, if you have any final questions for Jose, um, you can send them to xc2 at opwell.com or send them through the chat on YouTube or on Facebook. I still have a few questions I want to get through because this has been a great chat and bats are really interesting. I think really undercovered. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if anybody has any final questions, please feel free to send them through. Um, so I wanted to ask about the, the greater mouse-eared bat that you mentioned where there's just one left in the UK. So is the UK making efforts to bring back some of these rarer species of bat? And are, is there any chance for the greater mouse-eared bat that you mentioned? So uh, this, is a, this is a great conservation question. We get asked quite a lot. Um, greater mouse-eared bat this was always on the edge of its range so it was never um as far as we know anyway uh, there, there were never huge numbers of okay. greater mouse bats in the uk um there was definitely a small breeding population here but they've gone now what we don't know about this lonely male he's quite old now um he, well we know that he's at least 18 years old um so they're all all bats are very long lived far more long uh, yeah most people think of bats because they're small they must be short-lived they're not they're, they're quite long-lived um so is a reintroduction appropriate for this species we don't think so because in mainland europe the species is doing okay and they're quite powerful um flyers so if they want to you know if the conditions are right there's no reason why they couldn't naturally come back to the uk um, so I think it's unlikely there'll be any reintroduction program at any stage, but I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and say one day we will have um, a breeding population of the greater mouse head bat in the UK. Okay, that's great. Um, and and are any other species, are they doing reintroduction programs of other rare species? Or it's, it's very rare to do, well, I can't think of any reintroduction programs for bats. Um, the second rarest species is the grey long-eared bat, very similar to the brown, actually very difficult to tell apart. Um, okay. But there's only about a thousand individuals here. Um, they're really unique genetically. Um, so actually bringing more grey long-eared bats from Europe, from mainland Europe would be the wrong thing to do. Um, okay. So no, reintroductions is not something that, that really gets... A, um, some of our bat species migrate huge distances. Um, Nathusia's pipistrelle is one that's quite famous now because it, it flies right across Europe. Um, so this is a bat that's about five grams in weight wow. and it travels 1,500 kilometers each way. So 3,000 kilometers a year. Um, pretty miraculous creature. That's so amazing. it can move around. It's not like they are, um, if the conditions are right, they will come. Sure, that makes sense. Um, and then I wanted to ask you kind of this, obviously very prescient question before rounding out with the, with the question I asked everybody near the end. But um, so do bats in the UK carry many diseases that are transmissible to humans? I know you mentioned rabies and kind of that in their reputation, but is there anything that people should worry about? In short, no. Um, bats, there's only one species. Okay, so the, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into the technical side of it, but but in fact, in effect, one species, Dorbenton's bat, um, can, uh, we have found uh, EBLV2. It's a type of rabies in them. Um, the only danger that it poses to people is that, um, it, okay, so about 15,000 bats have been tested. I can't remember the numbers now, but I think it's something like 15 have tested positive. It's so something along those lines, right? Okay. Um, as long as you don't handle bats, and especially you never handle bats without gloves, that goes for anywhere, actually. If you're handling bats, the bats, you should be, one, 
you should have been inoculated uh, against rabies, and two, you should be wearing gloves. So there is no danger from bats in the UK. And I'd go as far as the danger from bats anywhere in the world is um, uh, minimal and no greater than, than other wildlife. Um, if you want to find out more about this, then he's going to hate me for saying this. The granddaddy of bat conservation is a guy called Merlin Tuttle, and he's done lots of um, talks on this topic, and I would recommend you go out and listen to those. Okay, good advice. Well, everyone look those up as well as the video of this this very cute bat waking up, which hopefully we can find on YouTube. Um, so I just wanted to finish off with a question that I, I've asked pretty much everyone who's been on here who's done any kind of um, postgraduate education, which is this kind of how you made the decision to get a PhD and any advice that you would have to somebody who is thinking about doing a PhD, especially in conservation, but really in anything, just considering a lot of the people who who are watching this and following this are thinking about going into conservation careers or, or studies? Uh, it's, okay, so I, I sort of accidentally ended up doing a PhD. Um, I was really into research and um, I really enjoyed, I, I was so much into research, I ended up doing two master's degrees, but that's another story. And okay. then at the, <laughs> at the end of that, I, um, yeah, I, I got offered a, I, I got invited by Operation Wallace here um, to apply for a PhD and it was working in Honduras with Operation Wallace here. And I thought, well, this, this, this is going to be great. You know, this is, um, and it was, it was a fantastic experience. What I would say is that if you're going to do, if you're going to go down the academic route, um, make sure that it is really what you want to do because it's not something it, 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 the, the final year I can remember being one of the toughest years of my life you know forget the field work and all the rest of it so make sure that it is something that you really do want to do I think in terms of my conservation career I probably didn't need to do a PhD I don't regret it and I think having the um, ability to understand science to that level is really useful when it comes to translating science into communication that anyone can understand so that that would be my my advice. Make sure that it really is what you want to do. It's it's not easy. Um, yeah. if, but if you want to pursue a purely academic career, then absolutely put your heart and soul into it. Make sure you're aware of what you will need to sacrifice because you will need to sacrifice. Um, or I think maybe not everyone actually. I've known people that have had a completely different experience with a PhD. Um, but yeah, just make sure it's really what you want to do. Good advice. Well. That's that's basically all our time, but it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, if there's any, you know, just to wrap up, are there any kind of social media websites, any accounts that you want to shout out that people can follow to stay uh, up to date with what you're doing or the the Bat Conservation Trust? Yeah, um, uh, Bat Conservation Trust. The website's very easy to remember. is www.bat.org.uk and lots of information about UK bats um, there. And our social media is, is really, uh, I mean, I, I sort of um, lead on it with a, with two other people. Um, and it's at underscore BCT underscore. Um, again, if you Google it, you'll find it. But yeah, you'll find lots of information on there about anything from training events to citizen science that we do a lot of, to um, latest findings in bat conservation. Um, nationally and internationally so yeah that's that's what i would recommend perfect well thank you so much for your time today jose it was really great to talk to you and if you have thank any you. further questions for jose um you can email them to us at xc 2 opwallcom and we'll make sure to get them to him so you can hear back thank you thanks very much thank you thanks ah.